Um, are you presenting any of this, or are you? All right, colleagues, uh, I'm going to make a start, and I'll start by uh, apologising for starting late. Um, we were in budget meetings, three of us, uh, so that's kind of what's held us up. Uh, the academic secretary will be back in a minute. Um, uh, here at the front as well, and Scott, um, whom some of you have no doubt met at this stage, and Anne will be here for the Q&A bit as well at the end. Um, so look, I'm going to try and talk you through this. What I do need to say right up from the start is the documentation is almost finalised. The uh, appendix in respect of how we will apply the gender quota is almost finalised. Uh, we hope to be sending uh, our final version to SIP2 and IFOOT. Uh, at the latest Monday, to ask for any final comments or issues that they would like to raise with us. Those of you who are in SIP2 or IFOOT will be aware that they have indicated, the unions have indicated, and I do regret this, that if we run the scheme, they will be in dispute with us. Uh, that's not an ideal position to be in, uh, but it'll be for Uderus to decide, Uderus, Uderus and Holtskala, to decide at the end of February whether uh, in fact, um, well, to decide on, on the step, on the way forward, and to approve the scheme, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, information as best I can, uh, but I'm only human, so if anything I say and you see it's in the documentation slightly differently, then the, the documentation is definitive. I will simply do my best here, okay? Uh, but I do have to preface, preface it with that, okay? So, um, let me start off. So uh, some of this is background. Some of this goes into some of the detail of the scheme. Uh, and as I say, we will have a Q&A at the end. So the last senior lecture promotion scheme was 2013-14. We had 104 applications. In the end, 31 people were promoted, uh, three of those on appeal, as you'll be aware, 28 on the basis of recommendations. The proposed 17, 2017 scheme is an evolution of the 13-14 scheme. And just to say in that context, there were a lot of people who felt that uh, we should move to a different scheme, one where basically there's a benchmark and, if you, and threshold, and if you reach the threshold, you get promoted. We have indicated to the unions, I will say, that uh, we are open to beginning immediate discussions about having that kind of scheme in the future once we get this up and running. But our feeling is that uh, people have been working, thinking this is a scheme for quite a long time now, and to move the goalpost now very suddenly without any lead-in would not be fair. So the proposal is, and Odorus has signed off on this, that we run this scheme now. But we are open to um, 
uh, discussions, beginning immediately, in effect, uh, that we opened this scheme uh, to see what, whether a future scheme might be different. Assessment is by academic peers in a peer review process, and I will go into that uh, later in the slides. The scheme is comparative, so there's a fixed number of places in a rank ordering of candidates, and that's one of the fundamental differences between the last time as well. This time, the number will be laid down right at the start, and the only circumstances in which that will vary, and it can only vary upwards, will be if uh, additional places are needed because the gender quota wasn't met. That's the only circumstances in which it would be a higher number, but the number will be fixed in advance. Last time, it wasn't. Uh, the various things that have uh, fed into this scheme and how it has evolved have been the recommendations of the Senior Lecturer Promotions Board 2013-14. They give us feedback on the scheme. Recommendations of the Appeal Board, feedback from successful and unsuccessful candidates. External expert uh, gender impact assessment of 2017 scheme. And we've had external experts from Oxford Brookes University who have input into the development of the scheme. Uh, Gender impact assessment of the 2017 scheme by the VP Equality and Diversity and by the Equality Manager. It's been approved by UMT Academic Council and Udris and Hoskali. The scheme has been reviewed by legal experts as well, in particular in respect of the gender quota. But in general, and we also had a consultation then with all staff in January. We got feedback there from about 15 different sources and we're developing uh, FAQs on the back of that as well. And there may be some minor changes there. People did point out some anomalies and inconsistencies in there that we will address. Um, key enhancements to the 2017 scheme over the 2013-14 scheme. So on this occasion, there's two, two separate schemes, one for lecturers, which we're now calling Lecturer B, for those who have a contract since, a new contract since late 2015, and one for Lecturer A, or university teacher, for those who have opted to retain that designation, okay? So they will be parallel. Last time, it was simply different uh, weightings of the points, but actually the ranking all went together. On this occasion, there's going to be uh, specific numbers of places set aside for lecture and for lecture A, and I'll come to that. Streamlining of the process, we've taken away the interview stage, we've removed the external assessor reports, two external advisors have been added to the board as process overseers, and they will maintain oversight of the whole process, including such issues as uh, consistency of marking, etc. Uh, greater external representation on the appeals board, Strict word, word page limits. Again, it was pointed out last time that that was quite variable. Uh, the application form will be fully online. Information sessions, and this is the first of them, and the recommendations of the board uh, will be ratified by Udris uh, Okay. Uh, well, that was true last time as well. What's meant there? So the difference is that they're not going back to the individual colleges now before going through the Ross, which they would have done last time. Yeah, okay. It just simply goes straight to Uterus. Uh, eligibility um, for uh, those on contract A. So lectures above the VAR and university teachers grade two, whether permanent, full-time or part-time, provided they've been confirmed in post. And then uh, contract B, lectures above the bar, whether permanent, full-time or part-time, provided they have been confirmed of post, in post. The date of eligibility is 31st of December, 2016, okay? The topics that I intend covering in this information session are the, uh, there, the criteria, the weightings, the additional material, the information session dates, and we have three dates. This is the first. There's also the 14th of February and the 27th of February, and we're also organizing one for colleagues in Shannon as well at their request. Uh, and then we have a draft timetable, uh, which would indicate that uh, applications will open as soon as possible in March, assuming Everything clears the final hurdle at the meeting of Uterus on the 28th of February. Uh, and we would expect to give people between six and eight weeks then to um, get their application submitted. Again, that'll be finalized by uh, Uterus. It is competitive. Uh, the objective is to promote on the basis of comparative performance. Uh, and this is assessed according to criteria which reflect the university's educational mission takes into account three broad areas. A lot of this will be familiar to you. A lot of this is actually pretty standard across universities. Uh, learning, teaching, and assessment, research and color, scholarly standing, contribution to school, college, university, and community. A minimum of 40% score is required in each of the three areas in order to be deemed eligible for promotion, and with higher achievement in at least two. And realistically, 
uh, if you look at the scores from the last time around, now who knows what they're going to be this time, but you were getting, anyone who got promoted was getting over 200 and significantly over 200, over 210 in fact in all cases and, 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 and there were two sub-panels and that benchmark was slightly different in each of them but it was certainly 340s, 120 in a competitive environment, you are unlikely to make the grade. That's the bottom line there, however, it would deem you uh, there. Okay, promotion is based on a fixed number of promotional places, a rank ordering of candidates based on assessment of applications. In this learning teaching assessment, that's the first of our three subsets. Applicants will be assessed under the following six areas, teaching experience and responsibilities, teaching skill and approach, curriculum and course design development, student support and facilitation, innovation and leadership, professional development and scholarship. So taking the first of those, teaching experience and responsibilities, evidence in this category should be submitted by outlining contact hours for a three-year period and submitting a teaching portfolio. Standard template and guidelines for the construction of teaching portfolios are available on the CELT website. And it should include a brief statement of your teaching philosophy. Okay? Teaching skill and approach. High quality of teaching backed up by mandatory evidence from independent student evaluation uh, and supported by peer review, external examiner reports or other techniques. If you're unable to undergo independent student feedback due to documented leave, you can submit other forms of student feedback and my office should be notified in advance. And uh, the email address for notifying that, is that Joanne or who is that? It's the SL promotions at nuigalway.ie. Okay. Curriculum and course design development, experience in the review and revision of existing programs, modules, as well as the design of new modules and programs, student support and facilitation, okay, uh, and I mean, you know, you can all read this, I'm not going to try and read this all verbatim, but you can read what's there, the kind of things that are there, innovation and leadership, opportunities for development of new programs, okay. Uh, reviewing existing course offerings to keep them up to date or to be new and innovative with them. Uh, willingness to experiment and innovate. That, that really is crucial in terms of uh, that, the kind of profile you'd expect of someone who's going for promotion. Professional development and scholarship. Applicants should show achievement in as many areas as possible backed up by appropriate evidence. Okay. Now, in terms of the independent student feedback, it is being run by an internal, an independent, sorry, an independent external agency. Uh, it's being run in the two semesters of this academic year and we're also working for the future to have this embedded as simply a constant and not done simply as preparation for uh, the SL scheme. Uh, you should apply for semester two by the 24th of February, okay, and even if you were done in semester one, if you had this done in semester one, you can still have it done in semester two as well, okay. You're asked to submit details of all available modules. The external agency randomly selects two to three modules per applicant. A random sample of students is selected and they are sent an electronic survey to complete. External agency collates the results and sends them to the applicants for review. Feedback reports will be sent to the SL board by the external agency. You do not need to include them in your application. Okay. Uh, you will have the comment, that, sorry, you will have the opportunity to comment on the independent student feedback. Okay, uh, and in line, note those things. So in line with best practice and to avoid survey fatigue, uh, on modules that are taught in teams, only one lecturer's teaching will be surveyed per module. Okay, uh, you don't have the option of selecting which modules you prefer to have surveyed, so you're supposed to submit all the modules that are possible there, and that's partly because of the whole survey fatigue issue. Um, and if you have concerns about feedback or given, given or response rates, please address these, in your concern, these concerns in your commentary on the teaching portfolio and the board will take them into consideration. Okay. Applicants who are unable to undergo feedback due to documented leave are required to include the outcomes of feedback processes conducted by themselves or otherwise independently conducted with their teaching portfolio. And again, please advise my office in advance if that's what you intend to do, okay? Staying with learning, teaching and assessment. So uh, you need a copy of your approved teaching schedule for the last three academic years, uh, actually prior to this year, therefore. In other words, 
uh, beginning 1314 and then 1415 and 1516. Uh, you should set out all of your undergraduate and postgraduate teaching duties, including supervision of minor dissertations. And the supervi supervision of major dissertations, such as PhDs uh, and research masters, they would be included in the research section of your application. Okay. Moving on to research then. Uh, your research, so for contract A, those on contract A or university teacher contract, your research and scholarly standing is understood to refer to research and other forms of scholarship associated with research informed teaching and with keeping up to date with developments in your discipline, as well as research as traditionally conceived in your discipline. Okay? For those on contract B, research as traditionally conceived in your discipline, including publications, PhD supervision, your research and scholarly profile, research funding, and research impact. The intention of this section is to allow you to set out your outputs across a range of research-related activities. Okay? And I, you know, I'll try and address any question you might have about that distinction uh, later on in the Q&A. Uh, so publications, see Appendix 2 of the scheme for details of the types of publications to be included. And one or two questions did come up there. For example, was, there was something about article in a book versus book chapter. What's the difference? I think for most of us, I mean, unless somebody tells me differently, I don't see the difference, so we may tweak that slightly just to be clear about it. We're also clarifying what is meant by editorial activity as well as a result of the feedback. This will be on the FAQs, and it'll, and it'll be, so those will be slight amendments based on the feedback that we got in the consultation uh, to the final version of the form. Um, applicants to the Contract B scheme are asked to list their publications by category. So that's what I've just been saying. Applicants Contract A scheme are asked to list all publications, but not by category. Please note the form includes only a list of your publications. Applications must include the IRIS. Applicants must include their IRIS profile to provide full details of publication. Okay? We won't be taking alternative lists. And the one thing I would say to you, um, as someone who for at least eight or nine years before I came to this institution was involved in promotions processes and, 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 and not least SL processes. Um, if you've got an article that has page numbers, put the page numbers on it. Don't be sending it in, it's an article in such and such a journal and leaving the panel to guess whether it's three pages or 30. Okay, put the pagination in. I recognize that some online articles don't have pagination, but if there's pagination, put it in. I've sat in too many boards where people have sat frustrated not knowing how to weigh up or measure something on that basis, and you rarely get the benefit of the doubt. Okay? It's your own fault. It's a bog standard thing in the search. Put the pagination in. Um, now, when I say, and they rarely get the benefit of the doubt, that's my, based on my experience of assessing in another institution before I came here. Okay? I don't know what the response will be here on the board, but I'm giving you a personal comment there. Okay. Postgraduate research students, research funding obtained by your research and scholarly standing profile, contributions to postgraduate research, research impact, research resources, and other professional circumstances. Okay. So the IRIS profile, it must be an up-to-date IRIS profile. That is what the panel will look at when they're assessing your publications. It's the only source. Okay, and it can be Microsoft Word, Excel, or PDF whatever your poison is, um, please ensure that it's up to date and contains your full list of publications and the publications are not duplicated. Okay. In terms of contribution to school, college, university and community, this category applicants are asked to describe contributions they've made to those various headings. Community in this context encompasses wider society, professional organizations, the academic and disciplinary community, language and culture, civic organizations, NGOs, the broader educational domain, in other words, outside the confines of this institution. To demonstrate excellence in this category, applicants will expect it to demonstrate significant contribution and or leadership. Okay. You'll be asked to provide details about individual profile across four areas, school, college, university, and then effectively external, whether it be professional, industrial, 
or in your academic discipline, wider society. Impact and influence, two significant case studies demonstrating your contribution are requested here. Okay. Please note, you should always highlight your own role. Don't leave the board in any doubt as to what your own role was in this. You're applying for promotion for yourself, not for the project that you were involved in. And that's, that's something that I say because that, that is one of those things that goes back to another point that is well documented in the literature around uh, um, women in particular sometimes being too modest in these things. In, in highlighting their own achievements, in, in subsuming their efforts into the team. An application form, and I say this to everyone, male and female alike, is not the place to be modest. It's a place to be realistic, but it's a place not to be modest. Okay? So highlight your own role in this. Don't repeat examples used elsewhere in the application. The key focus of the contribution section is on the following, what was involved, why it was important, your specific role and the impact that you had, and the outcomes. And some sample case studies from the last promotion round will be available to view at that website. Okay? In the final sections of the application form, you're asked for additional information. This is an optional opportunity to provide an additional 500 words of any further information that may be relevant to your application. And you're required to provide names of three referees, one internal, two external. And that is entirely your choice. Okay, that is entirely your choice as to who they are. One of the questions we had in the, in the feed as a result of the consultation in January was could one of the external re referees be an emeritus academic? Yes, it can be. Okay, absolutely fine. So, looking at the weightings then, and focusing initially on senior lecturer contract A, so it's 300 marks, of which 200 as the standard default will be allocated to teaching, 50 to research and 50 to contribution. However, if you wish, you can take 50 marks out of teaching and put it into either research or contribution. But it must be done as a single block. Okay, you can't take that 50 and say I'll put 10 in here and 40 in there or anything like that. You can take 50 out of teaching and put it into either research, bringing that up to 100, or into contribution, bringing that up to 100. And you must indicate that clearly on the form. If you don't indicate anything at all, that is the default. Okay? Senior lecturer contract type B, or simply senior lecturer, as was before the end of 2015, that is the default. 100, 100, 100. And as the last time, you can take 30 marks out of any one of those three categories and put it into any one of the other two categories. Okay? But it must be done in one block again. Okay? No breaking up that 30 and putting in bits here and bits there. Now that has a net effect. For example, that if you took 30 out of teaching and put it into contribution, that contribution would in effect be almost double weighted teaching because teaching would be down at 70 and contribution would be up at 130. Okay, that's about you making a call about playing to what you see as your strengths. Okay, but it must be done in a single block. And that's just reinforcing the point that uh, you must indicate clearly otherwise the default applies. The minimum threshold is 40%. That doesn't mean 40 out of 70, by the way, if you downgrade. It means 40% of in that category, which will then be weighted accordingly. Okay? And the weightings, by the way, have no significance whatsoever in anything else that you do. It's for this process alone. Okay? Sorry, did I skip one there? Yeah. Okay. So the application material checklist, completed application form is needed, the up-to-date IRIS profile, your teaching portfolio, and the name of three referees. That's fairly straightforward, and it's mercifully short as a, as a checklist. Um, the total page limit for supporting documents is 30 pages. This doesn't include the application form. Okay? 
So that includes your teaching portfolio, which may not exceed eight pages, plus a maximum of 15 additional pages in appendices, your iris profile, and any additional information that you want, such as a short CV, which is optional. You can, you can put that in if you want. Any additional pages will simply not be considered by the board. Okay. So when they get to page 31, they'll simply stop reading. That's the only way to deal with that. And if some of the key points of your application are on pages 31 to 33, well, <laughs> the board won't have read them. Don't embed links to websites in your application form. Okay. The board will not be doing, going looking at that. Okay. About referees, so three referees, one internal, two external, <coughs> and they'll be asked to comment on your performance in all three activities insofar as they're able to. So I mean, you might want to choose wisely there. Okay. A copy of the candidate's application form will be sent to the relevant head of school who will be asked to complete the head of school form. If a head of school has held that position for only six months or less, the applicant may choose to have either the previous head of school or the current head of school to complete the form. That is your call. And a number, there have been a number of changeovers of heads of school in the last few months, so that is entirely your call for people in that situation. And where the candidate is the head of uh, school, the form will be sent to the relevant dean of college for completion. Okay. Um, you must, sorry, I've skipped over one there. So candidates must indicate which head of school in section 3.2 of the application form. The current head of school will be the defa default choice if a candidate fails to indicate a preference. Okay. As I say, the dean stands in if the head of school is uh, an applicant. No score attaches to the head of school's form. It's used by the board to confirm information and evaluations, and that is in line with practice throughout the Republic. Uh, there is a head of school form and or reference in every one of the uh, other six universities here in the Republic that forms part of the process. Uh, the promotions board itself will consider all applications for senior lecture. In summary, the promotions board is compi comprised of 20 members. The president and I were ex officio. We're coordinating the process. We've been involved in the coordinating of the process. We're not involved in the assessing of candidates. And I've also instructed ISS to set up the system so that we don't have access to the applications either. I'm simply not interested in knowing. We've said we're not part of it, and we're not part of it. We're, making, we're trying to get the process in place, get it right. I will not be seeing in any way, shape, or form what's going on. And I don't want to know. I genuinely do not want to know. There are two external advisors to the board who are senior acad academics from outside the university and whose role is to provide oversight to the process. They'll read all applications. They will be involved in the discussions around scoring, consistency of scoring, etc., etc. They are process oversight, okay? But they will not be scoring in any way that will be factored in to the scoring of candidates. And then the remaining 16 members of the board are internal academic peers from a broad range of disciplines, and they're responsible for assessing all of the applications. All board members have undertaken unconscious bias training and gender equality training. Eight of the members, four men and four women, are in the arts business law side of the house. Eight other members, four men and four women, uh, are uh, on the science, engineering, medicine, uh, and health side of the house. Okay. The promotional pool, Uders and Holtzkola has approved a fixed number of 32 promotional places for the 2017 senior lecture promotions round. Okay. Comparative HEA data for seven universities was used to determine the appropriate number of places. The national average and the most recent national comparative data we have is what we used. The national average for the percentage of staff at SL level is 21.5%, in Galway at 16.4%. To bring NUI Galway into line with the sector, 32 promotional places have been approved. Okay, that takes us up to 21.3, but we are actually about 1% ahead in terms of the numbers of professors of the national average. So in terms of overall promoted places, we remain slightly ahead if we, by the time we've concluded this scheme. 
and there's more in terms of the number. I'll come to that shortly. Places will be allocated between lecture A and B in proportion to the eligible pool and allocated between arts, business and law and science, engineering, medicine constituencies in proportion to the eligible pool. Okay. In line with the recommendations of the Gender Equality Task Force adopted by Udrasen Hulskal in May 2016, the university will implement gender quotas for senior lecture promotion moving to a flexible cascade model over two rounds. A quota of 40% should be applied in this round of promotions. It, this quota will be applied across the total number of promotions made. And we are finalizing Appendix 7. We've been taking legal advice on it because what we want to do is make sure that when we apply a quota, or try and be as sure as we possibly can. You're never absolutely 100% sure of anything, but we're trying to be as sure as we can that when we apply the quota, it will be legally defensible. Okay, that we will not find ourselves facing down any other, no, there's no guarantees in any of that, okay? But we're trying to make it as watertight as we possibly can. Can I ask a very quick question? Yeah? 40% is either men or women? No, it's only, it only applies to women. Because the issue that is, and that's one of the things we took legal advice on. Because the issue to be addressed here is the underrepresentation of women, therefore it only applies to women. Yeah? And 40% of 32, by the way, is 13. Okay? For those of you who haven't yet done the maths. Okay? So that will be applied at the high level. Even though we're breaking it into lecture A, B, and, and uh, ABL STEM, it applies at the high level, the sum total of the 32 places. Okay? This will be applied even if total applicants, females are not 40%. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll take questions at the end. Let me go through the whole thing and you can come back to that at the end, okay? Uh, so, we are ref refining and finalizing Appendix 7 of the, of the scheme documentation for details of how it will be applied, okay? The recommendations of the Promotions Board will be ratified by the Governing Authority. Candidates will be informed, as in the previous round, by me of the decisions of Uterus. Promotions will take effect from the first of the month following the date of approval of promotions by uh, governing authority and all candidates will receive a concise feedback report from the promotions board. The relevant head of school will meet with unsuccessful candidates to prepare a development plan. Now there was a footnote in the document that was sent around in January and one of the feedback pointed out that uh, in that footnote it seemed to suggest that where the dean is standing in for the head of school, the dean will give feedback. That was simply a, a hangover of the way it was before and, and, and a typo, and that's been amended in the documentation. So I am effectively, the registrar is effectively the conduit for the feedback from the board, but the development plan to be put in place afterwards is with the line manager, normally the head of school, or where the applicant is the head of school with the dean. Information sessions, those are the dates. We also have a general session on making a good application for promotion, and that's open to all. Uh, and it's by those two academics who are experts in the gender field and who have been consulted about this process. Uh, and um, that will be on the 23rd of February, 2.30 to 4 p.m. Do we have the venue for that yet, Joanne? The HR, the HR training room. Okay, we might need to move to a bigger venue depending on the interest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's a general session open to all. Um, the draft timeline, and this needs to be finalized at Uterus, is at the meeting of Uterus at the end of this month. The scheme will open as soon as possible in March, uh, and the closing date is expected to be in May, as I say, a six to eight week opening period. We've looked at what's done in other universities, and it tends to be about six weeks or so. Uh, and the draft timeline is that uh, then uh, early summer, summer um, assessment of applications by the SL board and look, if Uders feels this should be shorter, it will be shorter, but realistically it will then be rat results sent to Uders for ratification in September, October with communication of results to applicants. And then between the communication of results and the end of the year, I would expect those candidates who were unsuccessful to be meeting with their heads of school and the heads of school to be arranging those meetings and taking the lead on those meetings to put in place development plans. And those who are successful, by the way, and it's something I think I made very clear last time around as well, 
uh, I would expect heads of school and others to be meeting with them as well to make sure that uh, the success is built on, that it doesn't stop there. So, I'll take questions. Now, what was your question, precisely? Yeah, so I was asking, the total 40% will be not in proportion to the applicants. How many applicants are female and how many applicants no, are female? No, no, it's in proportion to the eligible pool. And the simple reasoning there is that um, if you did it in proportion to the number of applicants, then the evidence from some other places suggests that then you get a lot of applicants simply to try and increase the number of places that will go to this constituency rather than that constituency, etc. The fair way, fairest way of doing it is the number of eligible, the eligible pool, the number of eligible applicants in an area. Okay? Yeah. And the definition of eligible, is that whoever is at the grade to apply or is that whoever re reaches more than 40% on their application? No, well, I mean, you won't know whether you've got 40% until you've applied. The, the eligible pool is, is uh, who is eligible to apply. Okay. Yeah? Sorry, yeah, yeah, I understand. Forgive me. Yeah. yeah. No, no, there's no interviews at all this time around. It's entirely based on the assessment of the paperwork. Yeah? yeah. Can you provide some guidelines like how much should be a contact hour for eight weeks for the project, this lab-based project? How much what? Contact hours we should put in for, like, if you supervise a fourth year project who was spending eight weeks in the lab. Yeah. To the lab this, so there is no guideline how much contact hours should be there for. I would work on the assumption that has been agreed with your head of school. That certainly wouldn't be for the promotions board to be defining for you. So, but recently we checked that there is no clear, clear guidelines across the colleges or across the schools on this issue. Uh, but the purpose of that is, is what? Because like that will be variable from school to school. But so, like I don't know if I have supervised, suppose, how much contact hours I could put in the teaching profile. Like I can put for lectures which I have taken, that's more clear cut. But okay. the thing is, if you supervise some of the students, then the two students, how, how do you calculate the contact hours and there should be some, like well, I, I mean, told in okay. GMIT and ITs, there is a, like if you have a full-time PhD student, you can reduce your teaching time by four hours a week. So that's followed in all the ITs across the country. Well, I don't know what the standard practice is here because I was never involved in the teaching side in this university. But I mean, is there a standard practice across all the schools in terms of what hours are allocated to a project? Yeah. Caroline, do you want to take on that? Um, what is the head of school form? I suppose is the main place for that to be taken into account. So the head of school form has the three categories, teaching, research, and contribution. I'd ask the head of school to indicate what are the workload norms for each of those in the school, and then ask, is the uh, candidate um, meeting or exceeding the workload norms, and provides an opportunity to comment if the candidate is massively exceeding it or whatever, you know. Okay. So, so that's the main place where information like that will be captured. Okay. Yep. How will the gender the gender of an applicant be determined? <laughs> <laughs> There's a very political question. That that is a good question. That is a good question. Yeah, it is a legal point. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anne. Well, I'm assuming at the moment. Quite honestly, I haven't looked at the the visitation of the application form, but at the moment, we're assuming that it will be determined on. Did, did you catch that? Yeah. So Anne is, Anne is assuming it will be determined on name. But that's a good point. Should we be indicating? Should we be indicating? You can ask people to indicate name on the form. I think we'll have to because I have a mail. Can you legally yeah. ask somebody to, what their gender is? I guess if there is 
it gets to the point of actually trying to calculate the quota, and it's unclear of what agenda it is, the applicant who is involved can be asked to identify their gender, and they are at liberty to choose to do so. And then the, the board will have to make their best judgment in that. But it's a fair question, and actually we, maybe we'll just raise it with the, uh, with the lawyers. Yeah. Okay. Kira. Um, I, if I'm understanding correctly, in terms of supervision of research for graduate students, that you only get to include PhD students who have already completed. Mm. You should, I mean, that's one of the things that came uh, in, in the feedback as a result of the consultation. So what we're going to indicate clearly is that you should list all, super, all PhD students you're supervising <coughs> and, in, and indicate their status, whether completed or not. And, yeah? and actually, here we're, we're in the middle of, and I think we published this morning a response to that question on the FAQ's oh. website, but it was only yeah. just this morning it's done up. Um, in fact, the box that asks you to fill in the contact hours for PhD students uh, gives you a heading called expected. So expected date when they're finished. So the board fully expects that. I, I know the wording says to completion, but the board fully expects, we might tweak that because the board fully expects yeah. to see all PhD students, including those in training. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah just on the uh, IRIS publications, that you have to load in all your publications from IRIS. The last time I looked, IRIS goes back to 2000, and it picks up your NURG. Well, it certainly picks up. It certainly picks up publications from other institutions because I know that all, almost all of mine came before I came to this university, and I put them on Iris. So that's not a handicap at all. Before 2000, I'm pretty sure I've got stuff from before 2000 there as well. So I think it does accept it before 2000. Yeah. It won't identify. Yeah. So you might have to manually put them in, but yeah. Okay. But what institution you're in, or or pre 2000, not a problem. Jane. In relation to your, your comment, um, IRIS is the only source to review publications. Yeah. So if you actually look at IRIS, there are lots of duplications everywhere. Um, and so when you say include IRIS profile, I don't know if you had a shot at that poll, but it comes out in a, in a pretty messy old. Yeah. So obviously we edit whatever. So I suppose my, my two questions are this, okay. For those that are OCD about keeping them up to date, we not duplicate. It might be the case that less appears if they include or download, and is that taken into account? And secondly, will Scopus and other sources be taken into account as objective? No. Okay. So there is a huge. So Scopus won't. Uh, Scopus won't be the first question. Jen was what? So I suppose there, there's two things. Like it's up to the individual to maintain, and I think that's, that's exactly what you're it. At, yeah. but uh, yeah. will, will the board really check duplicates? They're not easy to spot, and um, so you can glance at people's profiles when someone looks like they're 60, but they're 30, and they haven't bothered to tidy up, and maybe they've had, you know, so it's not... It's well, not well if, they're doing, if they're doing the job, they will interrogate it. They will be looking for that kind of yeah, thing, no, and if they, they spot duplications, they yeah. will discount them. And yeah. what I would say to anybody who's applying for any kind of promotion anywhere, I mean, yeah. it's the same as if you're applying for a search grant yeah. somewhere. You know, don't be trying to pretend you've got more than you have because oh, yeah, you're only going to piss off the reviewers. We've just got you know? the IRRP and this was, this was a significant Sorry, problem. Sorry. Yeah. So the, the related one then is when you say include the IR, your IRIS profile, you're not talking about the link because they won't click on the link. So you are no. talking about yeah. download. Print it off. And download and print so it off. So effectively yeah. what you're saying is to use that as your CD kind of or a traditional mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. You'll download it. Tidy. You'll download it. Tidy. What you've submitted, yeah. Okay. What you've submitted. Okay, got it. Yeah. I mean, look, there is, you know, I've no doubt that the board will behave in the absolute professional manner and not get pissed off as I just suggested they won't do that right but there is there is a fundamental point here that you've got to take responsibility for what it is you're submitting for your promotion and there's a, a wider strategic point that the university actually does expect academics to maintain their iris profile as current you know so because that's partly about external profiling that's what the wider world can log into and there is a strategic uh, issue around that as well. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to take responsibility for what it is you submit as your iris profile. And it should be properly edited, it should be properly up to date, it should have the information such as pagination and so on that I just mentioned, because I've gone into a number of iris profiles and there's quite inconsistent ways of listing these things. And I've certainly noticed duplication. You take responsibility for that. It's your submission. Tina, sorry, go on. I mean, often duplication doesn't yeah. mean that you list an article twice. It means that you've been invited to a keynote lecture, you list it as a keynote lecture, later it becomes an article, then you list it as an article. It's not meant to be duplicated in the same category, but it yeah. appears so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I can't think of the. Yeah. I mean, the board. Remember, these are your peers. They will recognize this. Yeah. You know? And I think that's critically important. You know, one of the things about the scheme in this university, by the way, which is pretty well unique and, and extremely rare, is that the board is entirely your peers. Um, even in the other Irish universities, there's usually a significant management input in these things in terms of the assessing of candidates and everything. It isn't here. Um, so, but, but I, at the end of the day, you, you are going to have to make judgment calls. Now, one of the reasons that that is there is because it was pointed out as part of the feedback last time that there was tremendous inconsistency in the amount of supporting material that people submitted. And that came from the board, and that therefore it would be welcomed if actually that part of the playing field was leveled for candidates. You know? And that's fundamentally what that's about. Yeah. 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 So yourself, and then Dari, you wanted to come in? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Dara, you want to come? Um, I suppose the reason why it's better is that student feedback can be biased against emails, but uh -huh. there hasn't been any acknowledgement of these awareness letter or information about whether it's happy to have a microphone. Anne, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think, well, actually, one of the mechanisms that allows us to come is that the person has the right to comment, and that's obviously a role of males and females. I'm sorry, I'm not, I can't hear you. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, um, standing with you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I don't put Yeah, that. I, I mean, basically, the um, writer was or the issue of potential bias and student feedback. Okay? Um, and what I'm saying is that in terms of the current application process, one of the key um, opportunities open to the applicant is that they can actually respond to or comment on that feedback. But that's obviously open to everyone all the time. It's not only open to women. For example, um, you know, if a member of staff either doesn't like the module that's been selected for review or there's some particular issues with that or if there's a feeling that the uh, feedback from the students is, is biased or unfair, then this is an opportunity and I would certainly advise them to use it. Sure. The other thing is that the entire panel will undergo unconscious bias training beforehand and, and we will be making absolutely sure that that, that, that happens. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the panel will do their work as professionally as they can and we will put in place as many supports and training and so on and, and awareness of those kind of issues as we possibly can. That's a good point. Really so you, know, you, you might have much more rounded feedback 
from other sources that you've done yourself all the time or that your school has done and um, okay. and you can okay, give one. Yep. Um, uh, I just have a small suggestion for unconscious bias training because I attended some sessions with, that were organized previously and some people actually uh, walk out before the end of the training but the very point of the training is to stay until then because actually crucial issues are discussed on, on, at the end. Mm -hmm. So just when it takes place to make sure that people stay until the end. Yes, we're taking our legal commitments really seriously on this so nobody on the panel will be leaving early. Yeah. Parik, you've been trying to come in? Just a, a very quick comment. The response rate for teaching feedback, I thought was very low, that you could have got a greater, larger numbers in the classes. Uh -huh. Or maybe that could be, that, that something that could be urged upon them. Carly? Yeah, and I mean, we had some issues with the spam filter, as people will know, so we sent the email out, I think, nine or ten times in the end, um, which definitely exceeds all the norms for uh, student fatigue, survey fatigue. Um, so, so we certainly sent repeated, repeated reminders because of the issue that far in excess of what might have been ideal, let's say, um, uh, from a, a survey best practice perspective. So, so students got lots and lots and lots of reminders. In the end, the response rate, I, I'm going to say, I think on average was about 25%, which is statistically valid in a survey score isn't bad. Um, you know, I think you'll get the response rate, I, I, I believe you'll get the response rate as part of the feedback report. So I think anybody who has a concern, you know, in some subject area, if a module with only 10 students on it, whatever, and, and there was a very low response rate on that, you know, yes. that, that's something you should definitely you know, put into your teaching portfolio comment. Yeah. And, and the board are very aware of high degrees of variation from the last time in, um, in response rates to this. And so they, they, you know, they go in with that health warning in their minds. And I think if you reinforce that by putting a comment into the teaching portfolio, I think that, that will be accepted. Okay. All right, over here. Yeah. Um, I have a kind of. I, I'm already half time being a lecturer, and I'm looking for motion in my other half time, which kind of makes it about as it is. The 32 positions that there are, are they full time, or are they considered just the candidates, that? individuals, 32 individuals? And if you if you're looking for promotion on the half time, it obviously will look different than for a full time, I mean, the numbers that you can present. Is that going to be rated in at the beginning? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't In terms of part time, for, for people who are working part time, yeah, so, so all the way through in, in all of the three areas that are being assessed, um, your output is, is, is you know, the, the whole assessment is prorated if you're, part, if you're half time. So they will understand if you're half time that that will be factored in. Um, and, uh, and it is applied across all three areas. So, so yes, we've had this question in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the feedback that has come through from staff and board have confirmed we had it the last time, and yes, um, it's prorated all the way through. Okay, now there's several hands up. <coughs> what? I thought it would not mean that um, two part-time promotions would be one full-time promotion. Oh, I see. Oh, I see what you mean. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're applying for the other half of your post to be, yeah, well that's a place, that's one of the 32 places then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That will mess up the overall university statistics because when you show us the statistics that NUI Galway only has 16%, then she's already been counted once. And then when it goes up, she's going to actually not apply two places. Go on, or not. I honestly, I honestly don't know. And Do the yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. You're right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a slightly different measuring scale. I don't know what proportion of the applicants will be half-time or part-time. I mean, uh, you know, but the, you know, the, the governing authority has determined that there will be 32 places, okay, for candidates. Not 32 FTEs, 32 places, okay? So, uh, sorry, your hands went up for a while. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I just have a question about the online form because some of the sections are clearly laid out. This is outside the... Um, the teaching portfolio and iris profile. So there's some areas where you're allowed 500 words, and then there's some other areas where it's not clear how much space you're allowed. And if you've been waiting for promotion for a long time, you may have a concern that you're going to have space in there. So I was wondering when the online form will be sort of available to pop in and out of and, and, and have a feel around on that. <laughs> uh, I like your description of that. Um, <laughs> Well, the online form will be ready by the end of February. We will be we looked at it yeah, pretty much really there now. We looked at it. Um, as, as to when they put it up for people to pop in and out, though, is another question because it, it's a bit of a it's a bit more complicated than that. In that it's a completely secure, password protected, protected system. So, so whether we open it before the scheme, whether we open access to it before the scheme opens or not, is a question I'd have. But we could put up a static PDF version of it, and you'd have a sense. To answer your question about how much space you'll have, um, the drafts that are up at the moment may not have nailed this down, but I think every place there is a free text box will have a word count in it. Okay. Every place. So if there, and I don't think it's reflected like that at the moment, but there will be. Every place is a free text box. There will be a word count limit. And the only place, I guess, where there's flexibility is in that contribution section on individual profile where there are four subsections, and there's a 2,000 Okay. Adrian, go on, you haven't had a question yet. Um, will the panel, or sorry, will the applicant um, be given in advance the detailed scoring criteria, detailed scoring that the panel will use to get the criteria? A detailed in what sense? The scoring breakdown, so for, for the different sections? The different sections, yeah. It's, it's not clear whether it's, it's, in, it's in the draft, yeah, yeah. It's in the draft, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yep. And um, will the assessors see before they score your different sections? Will they see the weighting you've applied to the uh, sections oh. in advance, or do they only do the self apply in Is is that ticked on the form? Um, my understanding, but we might just clarify this in the FAQ afterwards, is that uh, you actually, yes, you're right. You do tick it in the form. Yes, you do. Although it's applied after this, they will just score as normal, and then it gets applied electronically. Yes, because it's in the form and you have to indicate it. So the last time it, it wasn't on the form and um, and you know a, a lot of people either wrote it in the letter cover letter they put in or they or they didn't comment on it at all. Um, uh, but this time you are asked just please you do indicate it in the form. And if you don't indicate it, you choose not to fit in those boxes, then the default rating obviously for applies. It's a source of anxiety that, it, it that is, point yeah. is to, you know yeah. you feel like you're gambling. The one thing the SM board would, would say about that is that it was clear the last time round that there was an awful lot of anxiety about this. So the people in cover letters wrote, I would really like to have weighted my ex higher than anything else, but I was afraid to. Um, so I'm not. I'm leaving it as the default. And, and I think the, the board, 
if they were to provide one piece of feedback would say if you feel you really do have a strength in one particular area, please do not be afraid to wait it. Uh, people were successful by waiting all three, each of the three areas. Um, and the board does not care. Um, the waiting only applies to this form and this instance only and nobody uses it beyond that and the board really does not care. We did consider that, uh, and the feedback from the board, uh, and indeed in general consultation, some people did suggest that, uh, and it was considered, and uh, the, the overall feeling was, no, it's better to give individuals a choice, um, that it is better to give individuals a choice in those terms. Uh, you were wanting to come in with something, were you? So, suppose you get your score, and after the score in the appeals, can you change your ratings? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> nice idea. <laughs> yeah? Sorry, I'm sorry to come in with a question, but I, this is about the independent student feedback again, and the um, fact that only one lecturer is teaching will be surveyed per module. This is underlined in your in your presentation. And I read the facts this morning, it just came out, and I think what I understood was that a random sample would be taken of students and the same student would not be surveyed twice for two different lecturers. But there are many people going for promotion and in many cases several of us are teaching on the same module. Yeah. And um so I don't really understand how you're going to apply the one lecturer is teaching will be surveyed per module. And actually that's contradictory, I think, to what I read in the FAQ, because what I read in the FAQ, I understood, was that you could survey more than one staff member on a module, but you would randomly select different students for each staff member. Whereas here it says one lecturer is teaching will be surveyed per module. Okay. Well, I think, in a sense, both are correct in that the, the intention and the aim is only to survey students, one lecturer is teaching per module. That's why you're asked to submit your whole list of modules to provide as much choice as possible. Um, if it's a case that you know somebody only has, is in the lucky position of only having one module, and there are two people and they've only got one module and it's the same module, then, then you wouldn't have a choice about that. And then what will happen is two random samples of that class will be selected um, to survey. But but the aim is for you to provide your full list of modules so there's as wide a choice as possible. And the sole reason really is to avoid oversampling of, uh, of students on modules. Some modules are very small, as you can imagine. So, you know, if, if everyone was teaching on them submitted the module, or, which they will, of course, but if everyone was surveyed on that module, then the class would be surveyed all the time. That's also partly about fairness to the candidates, is, is the feedback that we have. Because, you know, if a student's being asked for the second or third time, then it might be that the staff members are being asked for and that, that came second or third, they're kind of fed up by them and the, and the feedback is more likely to be negative, you know, whereas it's a more level playing field if, if we're sure that every student's going to be asked once. Mm -hmm. Tina? Um, so I read into one of those problems, uh, the independent student feedback. It was not so much even about team teaching, it was more the case that you have like <coughs> one module and within that module different class options. So I would have one distinct group of students, another colleague would have one distinct students all in the same, under the same food. And I think this could easily have been addressed by just putting the name of the evaluation of the lecturer, the evaluation is about in, in the survey. This, the, so in, in order to, that only those students who were in that particular class would have given feedback. I mean, I think there are some challenges that are the, the, obviously we're doing this with, with an independent agency mm -hmm. because There are some challenges around module codes where, where one module can have multiple codes. 
Um, and so, so that is challenging, I think, if there are specific examples, let us know and we'll feed that to them um, and, and see what we can do about that. Um, you know, I think it is a challenge of the way some of our modern codes are set up. Yeah, go on. One last thing. I, I was a bit unclear with the, the Irish profile. Do you want us to download our entire profile or just the publications? Just the publications. Publications. Yeah. But do tidy it up and get it in a uh, ship shape as, as you possibly can before you submit it. Sorry, down at the back end. Well, assuming you haven't had a question yet, actually. Go on. Well, it'll be a Word version that's online at the time. It's formally open. Could we put a draft up? Yeah, OK. Down at the back and then yourself. Yeah. If you've been previously unsuccessful, should you, what would be your advice then for disclosing that, not disclosing that, or how to handle that? Thing, right? there, there's great. nothing on the form that asks you whether you've ever applied, um, and from that point of view, you know that's that's not part of the application. The, every round is its own round. You you put your application in. What information you provide is entirely up to you, but you certainly will not be asked under any circumstance, nor would the panel expect to read or be in any way cross-referring who has applied before and who hasn't. Yeah. Okay. It's just about your point about you know, action plans after an unsuccessful application. You might want to, you know, commonly with grant applications, you put a grant in before you then reference how you change your grant in the last round. You, if you choose to do that, that's up to you. Okay but there's certainly no expectation and nothing on the form that will in any way ask you to reference any previous applications. Okay. Um, yep, sorry. Yeah. So. Where can we find the information on the salary scales which will be applicable to these senior lecturers? Uh, it's on the HR website somewhere, isn't it? Uh, salary scales are on the HR website? Salary scales? No, I, I checked on the information because I made and the point one of the senior lecturer actually is below the top level of lecturer of the bar. So then there's a discrepancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't you don't get your salary reduced when you get promoted. I can say that <laughs> definitively. Um, I, I think what it does is it takes you to uh, what, whatever the first salary point is above the top of the lecture B scale. Or lecture above the bar scale. Yeah. Okay? That's where it takes you. Okay. Tara? The elephant. <laughs> I know that you can't really do much about the 40% quota and that's extremely legal and very, very difficult. But I suppose I just voice purely to note that there's a massive backlog and that it, you know, it's taken an extremely long time for that to result in anything like 50 50. Um, so I kind of, I really don't think it, it goes far enough. Or, mm -hmm. And so what you'll have is people who, you know, completely qualify and meet the criteria who are just going to rank too far down um, who are female. Well, I mean, I might want to comment. What I would say is, uh, I sincerely hope it won't. I sincerely hope we won't need to use the quota. And if we don't have to use the quota, then uh, that of itself will be a result and will be indicative of the quality that we have here. Um, but uh, look, Udris has talked about, Udris signed off on, on uh, moving to the, uh, what's the system again? Cascade model, flexible cascade model. Uh, over two stages, and uh, so this is the first stage of that. Um, obviously, it remains to be seen what kind of promotions around we will have in place for the next time around, because as I said in my presentation, 
we are open to uh, sitting down and sip to an foot as soon as the scheme is open to see what will apply in the future. Um, but governing authority has given us very clear determination in that regard. My, I, I desperately hope that there will be no need to use any quota at all. It remains to be seen. Anne, do you want to add any comment to that before we? And that, that last point is really important. You know, the question came earlier as to whether the 40% applies to both men and women. It doesn't apply to men at all. You know, if the round throws up 70, 30 uh, men, women, then the quota will apply. If it throws up 70, 30 women, men, then that's the result. Which has never happened before. Which has never happened before. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, one, last, one last point. By the way, uh, Joanne has just confirmed to me that the, uh, session on the workshop on preparing an application is from 2.30 to 4 p.m. on the 23rd of February, and it's in room G065. G065, which is in the School of Psychology in the Arts Millennium Building. Okay, so it's 2.30 to 4 p.m. on the 23rd of February, G065. Yeah. Okay.